Hi everybody, Al Bernstein here with another one of my boxing hangouts and this one is an on-demand one because we felt like it was kind of demanded in a way or at least needed because we're going to deal today with the aftermath of the Arislan Lara Canelo Alvarez bout which Canelo Alvarez won a disputed split decision over Arislandi Lara, disputed by some people um, and not by others, and that's the whole point. Um, and uh, before we get to our, our excellent guests, I want to bring in uh, Dan Parks, who uh, produces the Hangouts and who uh, helped put this together on quick notice. Thank you, Dan. And Dan, this is a fight where you sat in, in the arena, and of course I called the fight on... Uh, uh, television, much to my chagrin, because uh, we're going to get to Claudia in a moment, who said she she heard things on Twitter she hasn't seen in in all of her life, uh, mm -hmm. and I think I got called every I got called everything on Twitter. I got called a Canelo cheerleader. I got called uh, a, 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 an Eris Landy Lara um, advocate. Uh, <laughs> I, it was impossible for me to be all the things that people said I was on Twitter, which shows you the great passion of, of people for this fight. You wow. were in the midst of the crowd. Of course, it was a primarily Canelo crowd. It was, it was pretty, but the atmosphere was actually great. The energy there was amazing, and I, I can't remember. It's been a long time since I've been to an event where I actually felt that type of energy, and you felt it from the get-go. As soon as you got in there, people I even, were even, so I passionate. Upon, I even felt called upon to say it on the broadcast, which I never do. I said just before the opening bell, this is genuine, uh, you know, there's a lot of excitement here. It was, and, and you know, you could feel the energy change round by round. Mm -hmm. And so you felt at the beginning it was, it was so passionate and so strong, and then I think the first three rounds went all Laura's way, or started right, going, right. and you felt the energy start to drop, and then you started to feel the, the anxiousness. I mean, I've never felt a crowd quite like that before, yeah. the way that it, the passion, literally the energy of the room shifted so dramatically. Interesting. Well, let's bring in our two uh, uh, fine expert uh, boxing uh, uh, pundits, uh, who did a wonderful show with us just before the uh, Lara a Canelo fight, and it was one of my most fun shows I've done with anybody, not only just on this, but anywhere. And so uh, I invited them back, and it was so uh, uh, nice to come back. From ESPN Deportes, uh, who covered the All-Star game last night and was up till God knows what time, and now she's with us today, uh, Claudia Trejos. And um, Claudia, the, the, thanks for, for jumping on with us. Uh, you said that the reaction on Twitter to the, this fight was kind of extraordinary for you. Absolutely. We um, thank you, Al, for having us. And uh, I'm still trying to recover from the National League losing again to the American League. So we'll see <laughs> who from that league takes the World Series. As you all know, the last six years, that's been the trend. So we'll see. Yeah. And still trying to recover from that fight. Actually, it was uh, one of those moments in life um, that uh, you wonder what is it that people think that we saw. Um, at, immediately after the fight, we were on a spree cast with my uh, Noche Combates team, Friday Night Fights team, and we were making a comment as to how the different styles, you know, made for a good fight, but the truth of the matter is, again, we had skill versus power, and in no way, shape, or form could I personally see a 111-117. The biggest Outrage was when, in fact, I reminded people back when Oscar De La Hoya fought Tito Trinidad. Yeah, exactly. The last three, four rounds where Oscar just backed off, the judges decided to go against Oscar. Mm -hmm. So we were reliving this all over again. But 117 to 111 was an outrage. That's and yes. at that point in time, I was called a Canelo hater. Um, I was asked that and, and called names that. <laughs> in my life, that I heard. We won't repeat here. And to call you, to call you those names, how dare they? Imagine that. It was. It was. It goes again. It's a very true reflection as to how emotional this fight was, how passionate the fans are, and how difficult our position is. Because more than just boxing, we're dealing with nationalities. We're dealing yeah. with ethnicities, and we cannot. And my point is to have a fair, clean fight, and regardless of what the outcome was, 
117, 111 is an outrageous score. It doesn't matter for whom. If it was against Lara or for Lara or against Canelo, it doesn't matter. There was well, no I, way that yeah, I, I agree with that. Valid. I agree with that 100%. Let's now in, uh, bring in uh, Giandra LaBeouf, who is with um, BadCulture.net. He founded it. She uh, does great podcasts there and writes on that uh, site, of course. And one of the things that Claudia brought up, and this is the, the first thing that strikes me about this fight, is how passionate everyone was afterwards. And she mentioned the nationalities. But I, I have to admit, I'm almost taken aback by how passionate everyone feels about this afterwards. Um, it played out kind of, uh, Giandra, the way we thought it would, maybe a, a, a little more less engaging in Erislandi Lara in terms of action than we thought. But why do you think people are so uh, fired up over this? And you got a great response on your site about it as well. You know, as this fight was introduced, it was a fight that people wanted. They wanted to see the best fight the best, but it didn't seem like it would be a big Mexico versus Cuba rivalry in the onset and the promotion of the fight. But as the fight took shape, and Erislandi Lara made a real effort, you know, despite some of the middle rounds, I think maybe it invoked a kind of fear in people, and that's what made them, when people are fearful, that they tend to act out. And when it looked like a possibility that Canelo could legitimately take a loss in this fight, I think that's when emotions reached a fevered pitch, because not only does Canelo have the hopes of, you know, of a promotional team riding on his shoulders, but he's also carrying the weight of a country on his shoulders, mm -hmm. and when it looked like he could take that loss, he, you know, people just went bonkers. And my such a polarizing fight. I knew it would be, you know, a real clear divide in what people would want to root for, but I had no idea the outcry would be that way. I posed a few questions on Twitter to people just to kind of stimulate conversation. They just needed a little bone to run with it. And <laughs> I, I didn't even have to get, you know, the big Flintstones brontosaurus ribs. I just gave them a little <laughs> nibble and, and people just went wild with it. But, but the one clear thing that is very, very interesting, whether you're a Canelo fan or a Lara fan, was the fact that everyone disputed the 117-111, whether you were for Canelo or you were for Lara, which it was a ridiculous score. And I uh, for Levi Martinez. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Before we get to the scorecards, I want to add one more comment here. That is that what, what, what fascinates me is that we saw – we almost saw exactly the fight we thought we were going to see. Almost, I say, because we all did kind of, and I think probably, I don't want to speak for you guys, but I kind of, from the based on our conversation before it, it felt this way. Many people thought, well, if we see something, it's going to little, look a little bit more like Lara and Angulo, not quite Lara and Angulo, than it did Lara and Trout, okay? Well, it was in between Lara and Trout where, you know, there was very little engaging and Angulo Lara where there was a lot of engaging. It was unfortunately closer to, to the Trout fight. And so what happened was, in my opinion, we saw this fight where Erislandi Lara took absolutely the path of least resistance. And because he did that and chose to completely use the, his legs, his movement, and, and Angulo – or. Uh, Canelo said something to me at the fighter meeting before the fight that was fascinating that you don't often hear something that nobody has said, you know, at that point. He said, Lara's defense are, is his legs and only his legs. If you corner him, you can hit him. And of course, that's really true, isn't it? Arislandi Lara is a good, fine boxer. He's not really a defensive expert in, in the sense of a Floyd Mayweather or Pernell Whitaker or somebody that, of that ilk. He avoid, he's like, more like Roy Jones. He uses his legs and his athleticism to avoid you. And if you get to him, you can hit him. And that's uh, Canelo's big issue was, unlike Alfredo Angulo, for some reason, because Alfredo Angulo, although that's his style and he's an attacker, uh, Canelo's younger. Uh, you know, he has fit faster hands, etc. You know, Canelo didn't corner him as much. Having said all that, I'm going to look at the scorecards in just a moment or two here. Uh, and uh, this fight, as you as you see images of it, um, 
was, was a very, was, I think, you know, just the classic boxer and the matador and the bull. Um, and, and I think that the one thing that I would say, and let's take a look at the scorecards, Dan, if we can, yes, and then we'll up. weigh in on it. Um, we, we said at the beginning that, you know, the, as, as Giandra said, that the, the Levi Martinez scorecard was the one that people have an issue with. Here's what's fascinating to me. I thought coming, when I was at ringside at the, after that fight, I thought to myself, well, and I was probably the first one to make the comment, but I don't think I was too insightful, but I did say well, clearly the Levi Martinez scorecard, absolutely not appropriate. Um, you know, well, I thought that was a pretty benign comment. I thought, oh my God, there can't be anyone out there <laughs> right, who could think, well, not only was there somebody out there, there was somebody on our own broadcast who immediately took issue with that statement. Brian Kenny <laughs> got his hackles up and he was ready to start World War III when we got up to the, uh, to the, to the table. Mm -hmm. And we did. And he and Polly went at it pretty good. Uh, mm -hmm. When you look at those scores, I want to ask you guys, and you've kind of weighed in on it, but I'm going to ask you again. Are you surprised that of so many people didn't even see this as a close fight? Because there are a fair amount of people, fair, a, a reasonable amount, who seem to think that because Lara was not engaging and because Canelo came forward, that this was not a close fight. Either of you guys could, could jump in on that one. You go, Giandra. Well, I... Okay. Well, you know, someone made a really interesting comment about the fight in my Twitter timeline. I wish I, wish I remember who it was. They said that Lara, in his fighting, started off strong, but ultimately he resorted to fighting like an Olympian, and he wanted to strike and move out and win the fight on points instead of winning on attack. But we know now, as we see the trend in boxing and the, and the trend in scoring is, the name of the game is to come forward, engage, and make an exciting fight. What I found interesting about the tone and the style of the fight was the fact that Canelo went to the body. He did some really effective body work, but the body work, Laura still managed to walk through it for the, for the most part. Whereas when you look at the fight with uh, Laura and Gulo, and Gulo found more success with going upstairs. And if Canelo wanted to pull out that definitive victory, I'm just a little surprised that his corner didn't advise him to take a little, a little more of his offensive upstairs to drop into the canvas because although the body shots were devastating we cringed when we watched them Lars still kept coming he never folded he never fell but taking it back to the scoring I guess Levi Martinez is just a huge champion of body work and that's what he based his whole scoring on but ultimately it just it's just kind of disturbing. We know we won't see three people calling a fight the exact same way. It's yeah. just you can't get two people to do it. But when you have two people relatively on the same side of the fence, no matter what fighter they decided for, and then you've got somebody way off in the right field, something's wrong with that. It's like you spent some of the round like this, and then you look, oh, that's good. And then you did this for a while, and then, oh, that's good. And you the <laughs> I want to interject here. I'm sorry, Claudia. I got, I got to interject. And, and then... You know, Jenner made the point, and I really want to make this point. Yes, body work counts, and I believe in body work. That was when Brian Kenny was arguing with us. I said, hey, I believe in body work. Kenny Norton fought Jimmy Young many, many years ago in a fight back, you know, when he was, when they were, were contenders. And Kenny Norton couldn't hit Jimmy Young to the head, which not too many people could back in the day. Uh, Dan and I are old enough to, to have seen him, <laughs> but well, Dan's younger than me, so he he, made, he saw him when he was a kid. But <laughs> yeah. but but um, it, but Kenny Norton hit Jim, Jimmy Young to the body. That was the only place he could hit him, and he threw a million body punches, you know, metaphorically speaking, yeah. and landed a lot and won a 15 round decision. And some people really didn't get that, but I thought it was appropriate. I'm willing to give Canelo uh, a credit for those body shots. That's what made it a close fight, and that's right. what made it okay for the 115-113 score, which I believe Dave Moretti had uh, for um, Canelo. So, yes, you're right. You should give him credit. The problem is you can't get him to leave by Martinez. Claudia, go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt. No, no, not at all, because you just made a very valid point. Yeah, we're what – Will you give more credence to 
either position or power. Mm -hmm. How many times did he land? Where did he land? And I'm talking for both, for both Lara and Canelo. And talking about styles, this is another thing where um, something, some parameter has to be set up for yeah. the judges to be able to, you know, score a fight. What is it that you're really looking for? Certain parameters have to be followed because, again, we have fighters with completely different styles. And I agree with the fact that Lara reverted to his uh, very, not even defensive, Al, I totally agree. Yes, his agility is immense. He has no waist movement, no bending, no bobbing, no weaving. No. It's just physically fast. His hands yeah. are fast. But that's a style. And yeah. we got to give credit to that style as well. So, and, and, and just going back to, uh, oh, sorry, Deandra, just that's because okay. I'd like to um, make emphasis on um, Levy Martinez only because uh, in the month of July, he scored 47 fights. Out of those 47 fights, only five of them went to, uh, um, to one of those split decisions. And only in two cases, he was uh, uh, against uh, a majority decision. So... Mm -hmm. Really, uh, to go as far as calling him a bad judge, I wouldn't go that far. Okay. I'd say so you're saying his body of work, his body uh, of work recently doesn't suggest he should have been this far away. Exactly, but then again, we go back to a, a conversation we've had many times. There's vantage points. There's positionings for the judges. Is it right for them to be in different sides? Should they all be on one side? Should yeah, yeah. they be in a higher position in order to have a better view of the fight? you got to remember, mm -hmm. going back to the mobility of Lara, it was hard to see him move. It was hard to see him punch. Where was he punching? Where was right. he landing? Because he could have been just in his back. Let's, let me, add, let me add a couple of quick things here, Al. Let me add a couple of quick notes to this, which had to do yeah. with, uh, with the uh, scorekeeper. Um, uh, Steve Carp of the Las Vegas Review Journal said that he spoke with the Nevada Athletic Commission executives regarding Martinez scorecards. Quote, they expressed concerns, unquote. He tweeted, NAC Chairman Francisco Aguilar and Executive uh, Director Bob Bennett said Martinez scores differed by one-third with Vegas judges Roth and Moretti. The width of those scores is what concerned them, and yes, they asked him to explain his card. Granted, this was not an easy fight to score, but the NAC said Martinez work deserved to be scrutinized. Uh, the writer then uh, said, I agree, bottom line, don't expect don't Levi Martinez to judge a big fight in Vegas anytime soon. Wow. Yeah, let's, given that, let's, you know, but that's interesting. And, and Claudia, I see you reacting. I'm, I'm going to ask you quickly before we go to those things. So, do you think they're overreacting to this with Levi Martinez based upon his body of work, or is that a fair statement? I think they're overreacting. I think they should give him a chance and really, I mean, and again, we've all had bad days at the office. Yeah, true. Right. I don't care. No, not the, wait a second, not the three of us. Not the three, <laughs> never. <laughs> no, 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 of course, and we always have a good day at the office. Yeah. But, with that being said, but with that being said, do I agree with his card in this yeah. bout? No. Could yeah. he have a bad day? I'd say rather than just revisit his cards and go through his own investigation, okay. try to yeah. understand. Again, we've, we've, we've walked through this many a times. Where was he sitting? Where was the fight taking place? How far away from the action? Then, is it really a bad day for the judge and that's why he's going to scrap everything he's done? Is it fair? Is it fair? Uh, okay. Real quick, uh, yeah, either Al, real quick, Al, either Al or Claudia, Al or need, or Claudia need to turn your volume down volume just a little down, bit. A little bit. Oh, okay. Because uh, uh, we're starting to get a little re re uh, reverb back on here. Okay, uh, we're, we're, that. Yeah, it. That's it. we're too excited. Yeah, I know. Well, <laughs> this is the best part, though, isn't it? See, look, at, even we're excited. <laughs> I know. Um, okay, Be now. Wait, before, I'm sorry, Al, before ahead, we switch, yeah. uh, switch into another, another a topic on that, topic just on one that. last thing is the fact that you can look at Canelo's face and what the outcome was with the bruising and just the physical condition of his face. While the body shots might have been more visible, Laura obviously was touching him enough to the point yeah. that the divide in the score would just would be. That is a terrific point to make because it leads us to the next thing. I'm glad you made that point. Let's take a look at the numbers that show, show stats had. Now, and let me say a couple words when we look at it about show stats because I've worked with them 
from the company CompuBox, both at ESPN and um, at Showtime. And I want to explain a few things about this so people people really know that we don't use this as an absolute basis for somebody winning or losing a fight. It's a guideline. Um, so Dan, when you get a chance, let's take a look at the numbers. Okay, I'm going to put my glasses on, folks, because I'm uh, 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 need to do it. So you're looking at the numbers, and you see that very few punches, an average of just a little over 30 punches thrown per round uh, in this um, in this fight, which is so low. And of course, that we can is completely due to Arislandi Lara and his 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 tactics, but that's what it was. So you see that Lara landed. Uh, ultimately, at the end of the day, according to show stats, landed um, uh, 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 10 more punches or so than um, Canelo Alvarez, somewhat more punches. Now, and at the end of the day, the reason I focus in on that number is, for me, for me, Al Bernstein, <laughs> that's what it all boils down to. Now, doesn't mean he won the fight because he has 10 more punches, because there are a couple things. First of all, it's show stats interpretation of what landed and what didn't. Uh, let's take all those body shots. And I know show stats, the people that do it do count body shots. Which ones landed, which one didn't, we can argue about that. But they threw almost the same amount of punches going to show stat. They landed a, set, a very similar amount of punches, which indicates to you this could not be a runaway, and that's part of what it is. But here's the point. It's how those numbers are distributed in each round. That's mm -hmm. really where you look at it. And... There were, you guys made the point, there were very few, there were a lot of close rounds. And when we looked at the punch stats round by round, there were a lot of rounds um, where it was close. And this, this brings us to criteria, which we talked about before in terms of scoring. I, I'm going to say this for all the people out there that have been yelling at me in, on Twitter <laughs> and, uh, you know, and the, I, how they could is beyond me because I, you know, I mean, I, I just feel like such a nice person. How could they yell at me? But anyway, so <laughs> he said he said humbly about himself, right? Um, no, I, I get it. I get why the passions are running high. I, the reason you look at it, of course, in my mind, if it if we if you don't like the tactics of Arslan Lara, and we feel there should be some penalization uh, for really being. Uh, uh, less engaging, then boxing has to deal with that. It doesn't exist in the sport right now. So what we have, and, and, and the way the scoring is set up is absurd because the, the word ring generalship and uh, um, effective aggression, all that baloney, should just be taken out of the thing because at the end of the day, it's no different than in baseball, as uh, Claudio was just at, uh, you know, it's how many runs you scored at the end of the day. Well, in boxing, in my humble opinion, it's did you land punches. If you make a guy miss 28 times and you never throw a punch, the old, you know, great old story about Willie Pep winning a round without throwing a punch, which I think is great boxing lore, and, and, and people say, some people say it almost happened. To me, that's an outrage because if you don't throw a punch, you can't win a round. So that's right. Willie Pep is a lovely guy. So it's who lands punches. And that's the thing about this fight. Because of the tactic of Lara, Canelo was only able to land so many punches. Lara Absolutely. was able to land so many punches. We saw a cut on Lara's eye that came, we showed from an uppercut. Punches landed, some to the head, not too many, mostly to the body. We know that that redness around the eye of Canelo that Giandra talked about didn't come from a bunch of elves that snuck into the ring and put red spots on Canelo's face. It came from the fist, so there's Slandy Lark. So now this long diatribe, <laughs> and, and I will let you guys jump in here, um, like a senator on a uh, uh, trying to keep the floor, right? Um, you know, I, what I it agree. is that punches landed. Go ahead. In, 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 I, I was going to say that I totally agree, and that's the point. But if we go back to the Cuban school of boxing, is to hit and not get hit, which is what Lara would try to do. Eventually, he reverted to his CPU just said, okay, the fight is mine. I'm going to just move around and not let Canelo hit me. Yeah. Now, again, there are certain parameters that are, have been established and they're not written. Those are not written rules. Uh, again, uh, the, the boxing in general is very subjective. What <coughs> styles do you like? What styles are really attractive, not just for us as, as journalists, but for the judges, for the fans? 
interestingly enough, we were just talking about a, a very defensive fighter, Guillermo Regondeao. He's very effective, but yeah. nobody's going to carry him. Nobody wants to watch him fight. And yet he's extremely effective, he does plant, he does throw punches, but he's not attractive. The point right. is, can Lara, point. yes, can Lara be another fighter? No, this is who he is. This is how he wins fights. As a matter of fact, his corner never exhorted him to just sit for the last two rounds. So, In fact, Ronnie Shields, Ronnie Shields said over and over again, keep doing the same thing, because they felt it was effective and they... They felt it was winning. We, we got carried away because we saw Arislandi Lara in a fight with uh, Alfredo Angulo that was, you know, more engaging because Angulo forced it. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think I think Lara took him a little for disadvantage. Um, Deandra, it, it, going along with those lines of the, the style and whatever, it, it, it was, you know, you, you look at those the numbers and you look at it, you know, it created a fight with just over 30 punches per round. Uh, the interesting thing, though, is you can box and punch, and I think Lara threw less punches even than, than Canelo, which is what some of the people that, you know, feel that you certainly feel Canelo won the fight would point to. Mm -hmm. I look at I look back at um I had to go back and look at my own notes of how I scored the rounds and I scored the first two rounds for Laura. I liked what he was doing. He was getting in there. He was moving, but it was more ring generalship. You know that's the the hot term of the week, and a lot of lateral movement. But like um you mentioned at the what he what Canelo said in the fighter meeting is if you trap him on the ropes. He has no defense. And then I look at rounds three, four, and five where Canelo was able to cut off the ring a little bit better and do some work to the body. I think that body work significantly, you know, made Lara deteriorate and it decreased his punch selection. And it's also going to decrease the amount of movement he did. And I think that the I don't want to say running. I mean, you could say running that he did in those middle rounds that he kind of skated in. I think it was just him regrouping from the devastation of the work that was being done to the body, whereas he got out of his initial plan, what he was doing in the initial rounds where he was moving a little bit better. If he had stuck with what he was doing in the first two rounds, he easily could have gassed Canelo towards the middle rounds if he stayed in that same mindset that he was doing and didn't allow himself to get trapped on the ropes. Canelo came into ring, he was what, cruiserweight the night of the fight? If he would have done yes, the he was humongous. I thought he was going to fight like B.J. Flores or something that night when I saw him come into the ring. And if Lara had stuck with that original back and forth lateral movement, more generalship, instead of covering the whole rink like an ice skater, he would have been more effective in the middle rounds. But, you know, unfortunately, he, he allowed Canelo was effective in getting to the body, and it did take his toll on him ultimately and cost him those real, more rounds. Real quick, real quick, Al, look at the top of your screen up there, and you see where your uh, mic is. It's muted, and you need to click it to unmute yourself. It's right up at the top of the screen there. You'll see your microphone, and it has a line on it. It has you as a... It's up at the top of the screen. If you move your cursor all the way to the top, and you'll see the microphone has a light, a line through it. No. There you are. Oh, there we go. There you go. Okay. My back. Okay. Yep. Do we Get lose me for a second? You're you're doing <laughs> great. Now, do me one favor, one other favor. Just turn down your volume a little bit. On the okay. on your, because we're still getting a little bit of reverb. All right. There we go. Is that okay. better? That should be better. Okay. Uh, that was from, uh, great. Great points, Giandra. And here's here's the thing that I would that I want to say about it. That you you framed it so beautifully. What happened early in that fight is Canelo had those difficult rounds early. Where I agree with you, it wasn't the Lara who was the you know the invitational track meet. It was the Lara who was boxing effectively, moving, landing some punches, and and showing us the the boxing skills he has. Then I think what happened in those middle rounds, and you alluded to this, Canelo showed him some power. So Canelo hit him with some pretty good punches, but wasn't able to hurt him as much as Angulo was, where Angulo literally mm -hmm. forced him to be against the ropes and in one spot. He hurt him enough, though, that Lara said, okay, I'm not going to – my plan is not to stay there anyway. So almost instinctively, I think, it made Lara have much more movement. And the part right. that really – and that's when the fight – became this thing that became so controversial, right? And I think that, that part of it is 
that what I was shocked at, and I made the comment later in the in the fight, I was surprised with the body work Canelo did that Lara was able to be moving so much later in wow. that fight. Mm -hmm. That was staggering to me because he landed, Claudia, he landed some thunderous body punches, and I thought that would surely have slowed Lara down toward the end of the fight. And that's the true <laughs> testament to Lara's conditioning and strength and the fact that yeah. this kid has been able to sustain that kind of punishment throughout his whole career in the amateurs as well. Uh, remember, this kid has gone into meets against um, people from Afghanistan, Kazakhstan, the Ukrainians, which completely yeah. different style than the American continent in the boxing. But uh, one of the things that we need to understand, the mobility also showed a lot of deficiencies in Canelo's displacement. He cannot. His, his leg work is not there. The man is still very frontal, very vertical. Yeah. He's just a flat-footed fighter. So when you have those two different styles coming together and one trying to avoid the other and being efficient at it, again, we go back to a style, and I agree with you, Al, you need to punch. Now, if I would have had a chance, or if you would have had a chance to just go into that as here and say, dude, <laughs> give me three combos, just go back, and just do it efficiently. It's not about the amount, it's how efficient you are. And I think yeah. that's where his whole corner just went astray and did not stick to that game plan from the very beginning. Yeah, and Ronnie Shields is one of the best trainers in boxing, but I think if, well, really one of the best trainers, could be a Hall of Fame trainer easily. Um, I think if he, and he, so far, I feel so bad for him, he's frustrated afterwards. If he had it to do all over again, I, I, Claudia, I think he would, he would listen to what you just said and say, you know, we need to engage a little bit more here. We need to find these spots where we can do it. And, and here's, now let's, let's culminate this conversation with the, the part of this that, you know, looks to the future. It, part of the problem <clears throat> is that Arislandi Lara, from his standpoint, and we'll get to Canelo in a second, this fight was a, what there was no world title at stake, right? Mm -hmm. So this fight, you can argue, this fight was as much about how well you did as whether you won or lost. Uh, I totally Canelo agree. was an icon, you know. Canelo was an icon uh, already, uh, pay-per-view, uh, you know, driving fighter. Uh, Arslandi Lara, who has no single home base, coming from Cuba and being in Florida, it's not, he doesn't have a huge fan base. It, a lefty, not everyone wants to fight him, but coming off a couple of fights where he was, you know, the Lara fight, where the um, uh, Angula fight, which was so exciting, dominating Austin Trout, he built up a certain amount of momentum, and the idea was if he could really dominate and control Canelo and win this fight and look or, or look somewhat engaging in doing it, it would help him. So now with Eris Landy Lara, my question to you two guys is, uh, where is Eris Landy Lara in terms of the boxing landscape because he didn't fight a fight to market himself. He fought a fight purely to win. Right. Well, did you, you go, Jared, did you go, go ahead. You can go first. Okay. It's going to be interesting to see. Well, one of the questions that came up on the podcast last night is what happens with him in terms of the WBA? Because the WBA is kind of a little hairy in their decision making. You know, what happens with the belt? Because this wasn't a, a title fight. <laughs> he was a super champion. Does he remain a champion? Even you know, because the WBA does some funny things. Even if he remains a champion, what fights do they make for him? Because he has a style that's not fan friendly. In you know, there are fans. He has fans, but the majority of fans are not that excited or enthused to see him in the ring again. It would be a shame to see that someone so skilled will fall into the same category as Guillermo Rigondo, where you yeah. have this champion skilled fighter that nobody wants to watch. So he's in danger of falling into that, and I just don't know what's going to happen with him because he's not going to commandeer these big fights. You know, he has the benefit of being. And Al Heyman fighter, so he will have a certain amount of fights. That's a very good point. But he's got clout behind him, that's for sure. He's got the clout, but he's got he's in that category of fighters that fans are not gonna turn out in groves to wanna see. Yeah. Claudia. You know what? I, I go back to the Dennis Garcia, Mauricio Herrera fight that Mauricio Herrera, even though he lost, he actually won. Hence mm -hmm. he had a chance to come back to this fight. Um, exactly. Because we saw a warrior, we saw a great fight, an entertaining fighter. We always refer to fighters as entertainers. <clears throat> we always want to see somebody that's going to give their heart and their soul and leave it in the ring. 
And my concern is uh, Lara being as skilled and as crafty and as just clinically sound, he's just a little too sound. And that's my concern. He's right now in limbo. We saw a great fight against Paul Williams. I know I, you might recall where he actually ended up losing as well. Um, there was a great fight against uh, Canelo, I mean, against Trout and against Angulo. So all of a sudden, all the goodwill he had gained in those three fights has gone down the drain. What he's now in limbo, even though he's a champion, he's the one guy that nobody wants to fight because he's very skillful. No one wants to fight because he's not entertaining enough. And again, we're going to have a champ that's stuck in the B corner that perhaps will be there unless he makes adjustments. And we're talking about a guy that. Huh? High risk, little reward. That's how B will be viewed. I, I mean, I can relate to uh, Polly Malinaji. He might not win, but he's always entertaining, inside and outside the yeah. ring. Uh, Adrian Broner, mm -hmm. Maidana. I mean, we go back, perhaps not even the most skilled fighter, but El Chino Maidana, you know he's going to give us a show. So yeah. well, if anybody yeah. could just bring that down to these very skilled fighters, and that goes across the board for all the Cuban fighters, I know their school like the back of my hand. These are guys that have been training to be a fighter since they were five, maybe nine years old. That's all they know. They're like little, you know, roosters getting ready to go into a cup fight. And it's sad to see that that skill set does not have the marketability that others with less skills get just because they are good looking, because they have the right backup, and because they're good looking again. <laughs> you know, you can make the, the uh, analogy. I was, as you were talking, I was thinking, I thought of it the other night. Ersland Lara is like a jazz musician uh, who, is at, who has all the skill and craft, but when he's on stage, feels like he's playing more for himself than he is for the audience. And mm. we've all seen that. And you sitting there, and you know the artistry is really special but you're not as engaged in it as you'd like. And and let me say this, and I, I you guys have gave a new you've given a nuanced view of this, as I hope I have as well. So but I want to reinforce it. None of us, I think I don't think any of us are saying here that we don't respect the idea of the boxing skills. Guillermo Rigondeau is a perfect example. To my way of thinking, he's at, I mean I think he's a better fighter technically than Arslan Di Lara. He yeah. because he, yeah. he can stand in front of you and make you miss. Arslan Di Lara can't necessarily do that. But but nonetheless, you know we you can respect those skills. But but unfortunately, just like the jazz musician, who if he chooses to make that decision to play a lot of fusion and be very inside not engage his audience, and he's going to have a certain following that's going to understand his artistry, but he's not going to go beyond that. Same is true of Eris Landy Lara uh, or, 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 or a fighter like that. If you make a real conscious decision, which is what Lara did in this fight, that I'm going to use my foot speed and my escapability to try to win this fight against a fighter who I know isn't, isn't as mobile as he probably should be um, and who has issues with movers, and I'm not going to worry about whether I engage, then you're going to have to reap the consequences. And the consequences are that one judge, two judges actually, <clears throat> ended up going against you and that a certain, you, you will have trouble with future fights. Real quickly, let's, let's get to Canelo. And uh, um, everyone, I think, is in agreement, or most people are, that at this juncture, it, it, it would be nice to see him fight somebody that's uh, in front of him who can punch back. Alfredo Angulo... Unfortunately, he was drained for that fight. There were a lot of things that went on. He had gotten very high in weight. He wasn't quite the fighter we wanted him to be against Canelo. Canelo was able to dominate him, which was Canelo's job. Um, but it doesn't look like a rematch is in the stars for Erislandi Lara. So we're looking at Canelo against maybe James Kirkland or somebody of that ilk. Um, Giandra, does that kind of stuff, uh, do you like the idea of seeing him fight somebody who will be in front of him? Yeah, I do. You know, it's very interesting. One of my contributors had a chance to interview 50 Cent recently, and he asked why, you know, there was such a lack of the fighters in that camp in the ring, and he cited, you know, they wanted more money because uh, Kirkland and Canelo were supposed to fight before. And now 
and it was a money dispute. Kirkland ultimately pulled out the fight because he didn't feel like he was being offered more money. Now you have Canelo, who was this burgeoning pay-per-view star, so it's likely if he was approached, he would make that fight. I think I think it's it's a great fight. It would be an action fight. It'd be a fight fans would like to see. Kirkland would come forward. He wouldn't back off. They would engage, and it would just be a battle of power versus power. You know, Kirkland probably would have slightly more punch output than Canelo had, but it would be a great toe-to-toe -to -toe battle to watch. But I'd love what I want to see on pay-per-view, I don't know. Yeah, I'd love to see it. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, my question, I, I, before, I'm, I'm sorry. No, go ahead, Claudia. I was going to ask, I was going to, feel free to make your point, and I wanted to add on to it, because you're, you know, clearly that's a, a community you serve. Um, how are the, the, the Hispanic fans viewing Canelo after this fight? But go ahead and make your points about the other thing as well. well and that was exactly what I wanted to go. The, the main question right now is, is he going to stay at 154, or is he going to try right. to go to 160, because mm -hmm. he had a hard time making 155. So at 154, they're actually looking for uh, Coto Canelo, because yeah. that brings in a whole lot yeah. of viewers. Mm -hmm. That rivalry, you know, it's been there forever, and it's the one thing that Coto does is bring in the Puerto Rican crowd. It'll be a hot, hot fight. Now, yep. is it going to be that exciting? I don't know. I'd like to see. Uh, what I think it will. Huh? I think it will be exciting. If we see the Coto that we saw against Sergio Martinez that does not let down, or are we going to see the Coto that we saw against Trout? It's a whole different ballgame. Now, yeah. knowing that, Canelo will definitely go forward and look for that fight against Coto, and Coto loves to counterpunch and talk about body, body work. Coto does that very, very well. And that's the one fight that in our market is brewing. The probabilities are there. Uh, it'd be, to me, I think it'll sell. I think, I think sell. everybody will want to watch that, and I think that it's going to be exciting just because Cotto wants to make history. I have a feeling that yeah. Freddie Roach was also with, I, I believe you already quoted, he would love that fight. And I'll tell you something, Canelo was there all day for that one-two. And if he if he can't get some defense to stop that one-two, man, Cotto will be right on top of it. Yeah, Cotto, listen, Cotto fought, fought very well in the last fight. I, you know, at the end of the day, it's Cotto's still coming way up and waiting. I think part of that Martinez fight, not to denigrate what Cotto did, he did a very good job, cool. was that Sergio Martinez was clearly a, a, a damaged fighter from the beginning. But nonetheless, Cotto's reinvented himself, and I think that fight would be good. Um, it, it, so at the end of the day with this, with this fight, we end up with a very controversial decision. We end up with passions running high. I... I Conversations like the ones we just, the one we just had, I hope serve at least to to point out to the people that are so vehement on one side or the other that there is a lot of gray area here. And what fascinates me, and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna personalize this a little bit only because, as part of the broadcast, you're kind of part of the the whole deal, which. You know, I like to think of myself as sitting there kind of just covering and enhancing and whatever, and I certainly don't want to be a, 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 a too much a part of the process, but what I, what I sensed from it was that people couldn't, mostly in boxing, they have a hard time taking a, a nuanced in <clears throat> view of things if they're rooting strongly for one fighter or the other, and if one fighter takes a very um, specific approach like Lara did that distressed people and and that polarized people, as, as uh, the word that, that Giandra used. But I think what conversations like this, I hope, will do is to point out to these fans that there isn't a simple answer to this. It's not a, it, it's not a Lara's a chicken and he ran. Uh, Canelo, well, he can't cut off the ring, so that's his problem. Uh, in the scoring, it's like, well, he had effective ring generalship. Yeah, but he landed punches. It's, it's, it's like so many things in life, the answer is somewhere in the middle. And I think what we found, we had a perfect storm that night for controversy <clears throat> because Arislandi Lara kind of got – it was I don't think he intended to move that much in this fight, but I think as Giander said in those middle rounds, it, all of a sudden it was like, oh, I have to avoid these body punches. I've got to mm. – I can't stand and trade. I've got to do even more movement. So we had a perfect storm of um, – uh, of something that would create this kind of uh, maelstrom 
of reaction. And I want to say one final thing, and then I'll, you guys have a final comment, um, that, you know, again, I'm not trying to make, personalize this too much, but I was astonished. You know, in the world of Twitter and when you get instant feedback, <laughs> you're kind of used to it. I was astonished at the the vitriol and the and the, the 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 passion of all these people about this fight. Maybe I shouldn't have been, but I was because I didn't think it was that far out. And as I said, and I'm gonna be real honest, it started on the broadcast where in a million years, when I said, "Oh, Le uh, casually, Levi Martinez's scorecard seems." pretty far off the beaten path, and in our own broadcast, we ended up at the at the, <laughs> the, the, um, the desk at the end of the show having a spirited debate. Uh, so I just want everyone to take a, I, I hope that the folks on Twitter and everywhere else can take a step back and say, look, this was a close fight that you can make a case maybe for either guy. Uh, you can be mad. There's nothing wrong with you being distressed at Erislandi Lara being uh, maybe less engaging than you would like him to be. Uh, you can be. You can still say, "Well, it's up to Canelo to cut the ring." You can do all those things, but you have to understand this was a close fight. So, uh, you got final thoughts from you guys on the, on this whole experience? I would like to say that it was a close fight. That there's absolutely no flag. Uh, our job is to reflect what we saw. Definitely, we, we don't hide behind nationalities or ethnicities. It was a close fight. Uh, it could have gone either way. I would have been happy with uh, a draw. And uh, I would open the door for a rematch, just because I think there's um, the probability of Lara to recover from this and only come through a rematch, for him to prove that he's got the skills and the know-how to be able to handle a fight uh, with somebody like Canelo. And uh, if it doesn't give, if it doesn't happen, I know Lara's career will suffer. Interesting, Keandra. Um, final thoughts for me. You guys were spirited on the broadcast too. I was going to burn some sage for Timmy and uh, Paulie during the broadcast. But my final thoughts on that is it was a close fight. I think the, that both of them could benefit from a rematch because. You know, as Canelo travels on in his career, people will always have that asterisk next to the fight mm -hmm. against Lara like they do with Mayweather with Valdemir. There's always going to be that kind of taint on the victory. So it would be very serving whether the fans want it or not. If he has that definitive win over Landy Lara, then he can say this wasn't just a fluke win. And I think people would tune in to watch it. But again, very close fight. Much more intense amongst the fans in the conversation than I never would have anticipated it would have been. But it was very entertaining for me watching the commentary, the fight itself, the broadcast, and you know, ultimately, I enjoyed it very much. You know, it's interesting you're saying that, and that's very nice. You, it, it actually wasn't born in a way. It because there was so much drama attached to it. While it wasn't a wildly exciting fight, there was drama uh, attached to it, and so I didn't think it was like watching paint dry or anything. You know, it was was interesting. It's just was a little frustrating, I think, to people uh, in terms of the way it played out. Well, you guys are fantastic, and this is exactly the conversation I hoped for when we when you guys were nice enough to come on board, and I'm going to beat the drums about this conversation just like the last one, that if fans want to just settle in and hear about hear different, you know, approaches and different uh, pieces of information about the fight, they should listen to this conversation. Uh, and and it, for me, it was, it was fun, great fun to talk to you guys. And I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you coming on and uh, uh, and doing this, and Giandra, uh, they can go to badculture.net, of course, and uh, of course. see all of your stuff. What's coming up on your podcast this week? Uh, coming up this week, next week, uh, I think Mr. Teddy Atlas is going to join us on oh. the podcast. That's going to be a very, very good show because I'm a member of the Transnational Rankings Board. How are you going to get any opinions out of Teddy? I'm just gonna give. I'm just gonna give. I'm just gonna tell Teddy. Well, talk a little bit. You know, don't be shy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You, you, you. The good thing is, you only have to ask three questions. That's good. I'm just no, gonna Teddy, say. All I'm gonna say is Teddy. Course, rankings. Go. Yeah. <laughs>
Uh, and Claudia, you've got uh, uh, what's your next uh, boxing assignment? I know you're busy with all other sports for for ESPN Deportes. Well, we have Friday Night Fights, Noche Combates, that will okay. air live in Latin America on Friday, and then we'll have the rebroadcast here in the States. We're going to have Karim Mayfield against Emmanuel Taylor. Uh, that's our main event. It's so a good fight. You guys join us. Mm -hmm. And, of course, we're going to have Teddy with just a couple of opinions. Yeah, there you go. You're, you both are connected with Teddy this week. Yes, right, we are. There you go. So, <laughs> spending time with me and Teddy, it's exactly the same, right? <laughs> yeah. Well. <laughs> no, it, but you know what's fascinating about that, and it was shown on our broadcast. It just shows you, that, which is what makes this world such a, a fun place, right? We have all these different people converging, whether it's the media people or people in boxing, and everybody has their own approach and way of handling this, and it and and, and it's fascinating. So. Anyway, thank you, thank you so much, guys, for uh, for being with us, uh, Claudia and uh, Giandra, two uh, terrific uh, uh, boxing journalists, and um, Dan Parks. You're the man. Thanks for setting this up, and uh, I hope we'll get some interesting comments from the fans about this. And uh, but if you're on Twitter and you see this, and you're on Twitter, please, you know. Uh, uh, don't use any of those names that Claudia saw that she's never seen in 45 years. Uh, you know, to try not to do that. So, because we, we'd like to, we, you know, our self-esteem could suffer dramatically from that. So. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you, Dan. Uh, thank you, Dan. Thanks thank you, Giandra. Thanks, thank everyone. Thank you. All right. All right, Dan, thank you very much. And uh, we'll be back again with uh, some uh, Hangouts in the future as well, right? Yes, sir. As a matter of fact, uh, on this exact topic and because of what was happened on Saturday, I've actually been in touch with a couple of the boxing commissions. I spent a, a good amount of time yesterday with the gentleman who trains the uh, future judges and uh, was talking to him about the whole process and what they are going through and, and what kind of uh, uh, positives and negatives. And hopefully we're going to have a show in the future to just talk about judging and what it Love takes that. to be That's a judge. And what it what uh, they're they're trained to look for, and and how subjective it really is being a judge. Awesome, good, good show. Excellent. That'll be a, that'll be a great show. Thank good you to stuff. all of you for watching, and uh, we'll see you next time on the Boxing Hangout.